Welcome, uh, bienvenue à cet événement uh, à l'Université d'Ottawa. My name is Thomas Junot. I'm an associate professor here at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, and I will be the moderator for the event today. We are very happy at the Center for International Policy Studies, SIPS, to welcome you uh, today. I will be very brief in uh, introductory remarks because we all know why we're here and we also have special uh, opening remarks uh, coming. Just a couple points to set the stage. We have all seen images of the protests in Iran in the last six months. Um, as of now, the regime is still standing, uh, but as we will discuss uh, today, there are a lot of questions as to uh, where uh, the future of the country is headed. Um, whatever the future of the regime is, whether it will fall in the short, mid or longer term or not, one thing uh, seems to be clear is that there is no return to the status quo from before September 2022. Opposition to the regime now is broader and deeper than it already was. That raises a lot of very difficult questions uh, on the next steps for the opposition, the opposition outside the country, the opposition inside the country, the challenges it faces, uh, what it needs to do to strengthen itself, uh, and what an eventual transition could look like. Uh, we will talk about this uh, today. Uh, and other uh, issues. The format will be fairly simple. Uh, that We will have opening remarks uh, followed by a question and answer session with our guests. And then after that, we will open it up to question from uh, the audience and there will be a mic on the side for that. Our speakers today, uh, Dr. Hamid Ismailion earned a degree in dentistry and has published novels that earned him literary awards. Hamid lost his wife and daughter who were aboard flight PS752 that was shot down by IRGC missiles over Tehran in January 2020. Since the tragic loss of his family, Dr. Ismailion has dedicated his time to forming the Association of Families of Flight PS752 victims in Canada and has acted as the spokesperson of the association. We also have with us Nazanin Bonyadi, who is an Iranian-born award, uh, an award-nominated actress and renowned activist. She has partnered with Amnesty International since 2008, with a focus on the unjust conviction of Iranian youth, women, and prisoners of conscience. Her activism has taken her to the Bundestag, to the UK Parliament, to the Canadian Parliament, um, Capitol Hill, the White House, the UN, and several other places. She also currently serves as an Amnesty International UK ambassador and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I regret uh, that just before the event, Abdullah Mahtadi, who was supposed to be our third uh, speaker today, unfortunately had to cancel. So I do apologize for that. Uh, we also want to say that we did invite other members of the uh, Alliance for uh, Democracy and Freedom in Iran, but unfortunately for logistical reasons, they were not able to come. Um, just before we start the event, I would like to invite Ali Essassi for opening remarks. Ali Essassi has served as the Member of Parliament for the Toronto Riding of Willowdale since 2015. He is a member of the Liberal Caucus and currently serves as the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. Um, Ali, uh, thank you very much for your help in organizing this and I give the floor to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see you here. What an incredible building. Um, I obviously have always been uh, impressed with uh, with your program here at SIPS, uh, but uh, because, you know, given the location, I, I know that the greatest minds come out of uh, this particular center in the University of Ottawa. So uh, great to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, my name is Ali Asasi. I'm, uh, I'm the Member of Parliament for Willowdale. Uh, and as uh, was explained, uh, currently serving as the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I must admit, however, that I have never heard anyone pronounce my name as nice as uh, Professor Genot did. He gives it that French spin, which is, uh, it certainly works for me. But uh, the reason I'm here is just to, uh, to uh, thank SIPS for having made this all possible. And it really was uh, on short notice uh, that uh, Professor Jeannot, uh was good enough to say, absolutely, uh, we would love to hear uh, from the stellar uh, speakers that we have uh, before us uh, today. And of course, you've all been following uh, the uh, uprisings, revolution that has been gripping uh, Iran over the course of the past six months. 
And the reason why we're very, very fortunate to be here today uh, with the two speakers we have here is it's really difficult to keep up with either one of them. You could turn on Fareed Zakaria and you see uh, Ms. Bonyadi. Uh, you turn on CBC, you see uh, Hamid. And then you know, you're following social media and you see them in legislatures uh, all over the place. Or uh, you see uh, Ms. Bonyadi at the Security Council uh, making the case. So these are two extraordinary individuals uh, who have worked um, tirelessly uh, over the course of the past six months. And it's great to have them here uh, with us today so uh, you can uh, ask the difficult questions uh, of them. But uh, before we get into that, and I certainly appreciate that's the reason why we're here, because you want to ask them uh, the tough questions. Uh, let me just say this, because uh, far too often we hear, um, you know, what's going to happen in Iran? Let me assure and impress upon every single one of you that this is the beginning of the end. Now, why do I say that? Because if anyone actually follows uh, what is uh, unfolding, not just with the social movements that we see in over 100 cities, but if you actually look at all those indicators in Iran, it is pretty obvious that after 44 years, Iranians are absolutely fed up and, uh, and are done with the Islamic Republic. This is a country, after all, which intervenes in all sorts of uh, scenarios uh, around the world. The latest, obviously, being Ukraine. Uh, but prior to that also, uh, there was uh, Syria, where Iran and Russia partnered up with the Assad regime uh, and committed uh, atrocities there. And of course, there's also uh, Yemen as well. So Iranians are fully cognizant of those realities. But they're also cognizant of the kleptocracy and the inflation, there is literally no good indicator you can find in Iran where Iranians can say, you know what? Even if I have my disagreements with these guys, everything is going to be okay. They don't. The uh, feral economics we see in that country uh, truly, truly worry me. The uh, human rights situation, 20,000 uh, people uh, being incarcerated. So if anyone does tell you, that it seems like this revolution might be over, believe me, that is not the case. But of course, you will hear uh, from our speakers on that issue. But let me leave you with uh, two thoughts uh, before, um, before we hear from our exceptional speakers here. Uh, the first one is, uh, we all look at uh, politics from a comparative uh, perspective. And yes, what we have seen in Iran is truly, truly unique. Uh, in Russia, we did see protests, but I didn't see anyone getting manhandled in public by Russian security officials. God knows what's going on in their detention centers. But insofar as the public uh, could see how the Russians were dealing with protesters there, there was no manhandling. Compare that to what we saw over the course of the past six months in Iran. Look at how the Iranian government deals with its cultural luminaries its public figures who they, they have thrown in jail uh, and are constantly getting in the way. Or can anyone here think of another country where the most popular athletes in the country are either killed, thrown in jail, and treated in such a terrible uh, way? So all that to say, this uh, revolution uh, is definitely not done, and we're, we're bound to see uh, a lot of things in the future. And the question is, if you have a regime such as this, where 80% of Iranians have recently indicated that they are done with the Islamic Republic, 80%, how does one deal with a country of that nature? That's the first thing, because I truly can't think of any other authoritarian state which has such little legitimacy uh, with its own public. That's the first question I wanted to leave you with. And the second one is, I think in these uncertain times where we're all concerned about how authoritarian uh, regimes are working together, um, and we all talk about the alliance uh, for democracies, and we all recognize full well that perhaps we were not vigilant 
with Mr. Putin. He kept doing terrible things and we just thought, oh, best that we not deal with it. So in this particular case, when you have the terrible uh, tragedy that is occurring in Iran, what is it we need to do? Because I certainly hope the lessons learned from Mr. Putin and trying to appease him are things that will also apply to Iran. It's important that we stand up uh, for the courageous uh, people of Iran. So wanted to leave you with those thoughts. Wanted to thank you all for being here, in particular, particular Professor Jeannot and the two magnificent uh, speakers who really, really are the pride and joy of uh, everyone who's been following developments in Iran. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Ali, for uh, that. So let's move on to the main portion of the show, which is a bit of a fireside chat format. It will be fairly informal. I will ask questions to our two great speakers. In some cases, I will ask it specifically to one of you, but the other one is obviously more than welcome to uh, join in um, as, as you wish. Um, so as a first question, uh, and this uh, refers in a way to some points that Ali was making uh, right now, the momentum of the street protests in Iran um, was very high during the fall, but seems to have uh, slowed down a bit, or at least for now. Um, where is the protest movement in Iran going, uh, in your view? And, and maybe for this question, we can start with both of you, maybe starting with uh, yourself. Yeah. yeah, my voice is not very loud, so I will need this. Hello, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you, Professor Janot. Chairman Essasi and my good friend and colleague, Dr. Esmail Um, You know, I've been in this human rights advocacy space for 15 years now, and never have I seen the, the fervor um, that I'm seeing on the streets of Iran, as we're seeing today. Um, we're, of course, used to seeing uprising, mass uprisings once every decade, whether it was um, the student protests of 99, um, the Green Movement of 2009, and of course, the bloody November protests of 2019. But what sets this apart is that you have for the first time people fighting, actively fighting back against the security forces um, to defend themselves, um, and that it's female-led, you know, and the spark and engine has been women. Uh, of course, it's galvanized society at large, Iranian society at large, to into a pro-democracy pro movement um, supported by the brave men, the, brother, the brothers, the, the husbands, the fathers and sons of those women. They understand the intersectionality of gender equality and every other basic human right that the Iranian people have been denied now for 44 years. But really what, what sets this apart and what makes it different, and I think um, will give it legs, if you will, to move forward and um, succeed, is that women have central participation. And we've seen in Argentina, we've seen in Chile, in Brazil, the Philippines, Poland in the 1980s, that when women are at the center of these protests, the chance of it succeeding, the movement succeeding, is higher. Um, what we have as a responsibility, the international community, is of course the margin between success and failure is very slim. And we have the responsibility of tipping this uh, in favor of the protesters um, and ensuring that democracy prevails. But I do think that's what's gonna make it sustainable. Female um, participation is central. And the fact that there is a synergy now between um, inside people, inside distance in Iran and outside, I think our alliance is a demonstration of that. Uh, and it's, it's really unprecedented in 44 years of, uh, of the struggle inside Iran. Thank you very much. Uh, I say hi to everybody. It's very happy to, I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, and thank you, Professor Jono, for this um, meeting. Uh, I just want to give you an example that how this revolution changed everything. You know, for the last three years and almost three months, our association or the association of the victims, like the families of PS75 too, has tried hard to uh, push everybody to seek justice for the victims. There have been events, there have been protests uh, that we were looking for uh, like a exact, like a number of people to join the protest uh, to, to hold the photos of the victims, that there were 177 victims on that plane. 
I remember like when we were in Montreal, like uh, two years ago, we had difficulty with that. And um, some of the family members, they had to hold two photos in their hands because there were not enough, enough people in the protest. I remember on uh, the last time we were here, that was 4th of October, 2022, like six months ago, a month before this event, there was a discussion among the members of the association that, okay, how many people we can bring from Toronto? How many people from Montreal? And how many people from Ottawa? And we had probably 200 people roughly then. Uh, and something that I heard uh, was uh, that people probably are afraid to join because they think that the families of the victims now thinking about overthrowing the regime. And there, if there's a fear, if they join that, protests, it would be persecution when they go back to Iran and all of that. But what happened? On 4th of October last year here, there were thousands of people. And this is the way revolution changed everything. You know, they killed Mahsa Amini like 20 days before that. I just want to tell you that this revolution is an, an inevitable reality never goes back to the situation, never goes back the way it was a year ago or seven months ago. There has been a revolution in the minds of people that now majority of them, they think that they don't want this regime anymore. And when there are surveys, there have been surveys in the last six months and we see that like more than 80% of people inside and out of Iran, they don't want this regime anymore. So if you don't see it in the street, it, uh, in Tehran, in other cities, it doesn't mean that it is slowed down. Actually, every Friday we see in Zahedan people coming to the street in Kurdistan like a few days ago. And I think the next waves of the revolution are in this underway and they will come back. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing that we've seen in the last few months is uh, a lot of work outside the country with the likes of yourself, the creation of the Alliance for Democracy and Freedom in Iran, uh, with your your four other colleagues. Um, there has been, and I think it's 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 fair to say, a a, a surprising uh, and and extensive unity among the opposition in exile, which is a, a an important step. Um, um, as the protests continue, uh, what else has to happen for this unity in the among the opposition in exile to continue and to hopefully strengthen? Maybe starting this time with yourself. You know what we could do when when this revolution started, uh, there was a lot of demands from from the public inside the country and people in diaspora, and uh, all of us, you know that. Uh, People were asking us to sit together and you know try to make this unity happen. Then we were thinking, what is the best way to come together and discuss the ways that we can work together? And then the idea of charter came up. So we decided to uh, agree on some principles that we all of us we can agree on, and then we can, based on that principles, we can go and ask other political leaders, public figures, political parties to join us. And um, there, are, there are a few steps that we have to take on our way. The first one, I think the most important one is in or organize. We have to organize a uh, majority of people that they want to help. I know I hear from here and there that there is one group in this country, in that little town that they're trying to help someone in Iran or some groups in Iran. We have to uh, organize all of these people and unite all, all of these people. That needs a lot of work. But I think this charter was just a base for these six individuals uh, to, to be able to work together. I would just add, I, I completely agree. You know, I'm, I'm an actress and an activist. So for me, diving into the, the policy and the um, I, I take that back. I've been in the policy world, but not so much in the political sphere. Um, but setting setting aside one's differences is in itself a, a demonstration in democracy. Um, if we want democracy to prevail, the first thing we need to do is to take this dictatorial mindset 
strip ourselves from the, this dictatorial mindset, which has been etched in our minds by the Islamic Republic for 44 years. When we see someone taking action that is actually creating tangible results and positive change, we should be able to empower that person. Ask them, how can I help? How can I contribute? Not how do I detract? How do I stop? How do I slow down that process? How do I compete? We're all in this together. I don't think we have any claim of being leaders of Iran. We're tr simply trying to form some kind of convening power and, you know, me tapping into my resources, Dr. Esma Elyon, uh, Prince Reza Pahlavi, Masi Ali Nejad, everybody trying to take their platforms and use that for a free and democratic Iran so that the ultimate, ultimately the decision is made by the Iranian people at a free and fair election, at a referendum, at the ballot box. None of us are claiming power. And so that to me is a demonstration in democracy that everyone should be supporting. And, um, and I know that we have intentions of working with a broader, more pluralistic group. That is our next step we're actively working on of bringing in other minority groups, whether it's like sexual minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, um, various other political ideologies, because that is, plurality is extremely important in this process. So on this issue of, uh, you mentioned the possibility of free and fair elections in a post-Islamic Republic Iran. On this issue of a transition, um, if or when uh, the Islamic Republic falls, uh, the question of the transition then becomes the dominant issue in the in the debate. Uh, post uh, dictatorial transitions are never simple; uh, they historically have been complicated, uh, often messy and violent. Um, in the case of, of Iran, which is is different uh, from historical precedents in many ways, um, but you know, the, the regime, as was said by Ali at the beginning, has lost a lot of support, but still maintains pockets of support uh, inside the country, which in many cases are ideologically committed, in some cases are well armed. Um, so th the transition would be difficult uh, in, in the best of cases. So can you tell us a bit more, uh, the two of you, about how the alliance that you've been working with, and you mentioned the issue, for example, of integrating minorities, which I think is extremely important for that to happen. But can you dive a bit more in detail on what, how you see the transition uh, unfolding? Um, I think there are important historic lessons, good and bad, to be taken from Egypt and Iraq um, and other countries, of course, Tunisia. Um, and, you know, when you're dismantling a regime and you're trying to bring about democracy, there has to be transitional justice. There has to be, we've, we've alluded to it in our charter. Um, and, but also, you know, when you look at truth and reconciliation in South Africa and Sierra, Le Sierra Leone, there are, in those committees, it's very important that you hold um, perpetrators to account and um, empower civil society in the process of self-determination. And these are all things that, you know, experts far smarter than I have, have written about and, and um, that we should, we should heed their advice and, and their calls. But I think it's a long drawn pro process, only aided by plurality, only aided by us coming together and uniting, uniting on one thing, and that's a secular democratic Iran. What, what you're talking about, I think, uh brings the, this uh, transitional justice to my mind. That's the most important, I think one of the most important pillars of this revolution. Um, first of all, I think this revolution is not about uh, like a specific ideology. In 1979, when that happened, there were Islamists that they, they were uh, acting to, to overthrow their um, government. But now you see that the, uh, Gen Zs are, are in the streets. They want to change the norms, uh, like the religious norms, the, the social norms, and all of that. And they're, you know, some talking about human rights, some talking about social justice, some talk about environmental equality and freedom is the most important thing. Under freedom, we can have all of this. So transitional justice is important here because uh, uh, we, we know that after the revolution, there are things that can happen. So, and 
in this transitional justice, I think the role of the uh, families of the victims is very important. In that charter, we talked about death penalty, that we don't want to have death penalty in future in Iran. I think the families are, of the victims are very important to change this mindset. And, you know, Iran has had death penalty for, uh, I mean, centuries. And uh, changing this, it won't be easy, but I think the families of the victims can do that. And if we can assure people that after the revolution, it wouldn't be uh, such a thing or like a, a trials with uh, no right for defense, that this is a way that we see it in the Islamic Republic every day, I think then then we can we can help people to, or people in the in the government to think, okay, if this revolution happens, they won't kill us. That's important, and we have to work on it. So the, it is one of the steps that Alliance and the, the families of the victims that they're forming organizations these days uh, can be very helpful on. If I can just pick up on one point that you you mentioned before going on to my, my next question, the list, which is the issue of integrating uh, representatives of minorities in the Alliance and and more broadly speaking in the in the transition. And, that's one, it's very unfortunate that Mr. Mohtadi couldn't be with us uh, today, but the, the population of Iran, almost half of it is uh, non-Persian, uh, Baluch, Kurd, uh, and so on. Um, Arabs, uh, the list goes on. Uh, has enough been done so far? And, and what else has to be done to ensure a, a strong and, and genuine representation of that vast range of, of minority groups uh, within the, the opposition? We are very happy that Mr. Muhtadi is in the alliance, um, and we hope that we can be able to work with other ethnicities as well. I'm not sure about that 50%, though, that uh, the 50% are uh, minorities, but uh, uh, if, if, we be, if we go based on Farsi-speaking people, I think more than 70% of Iranians speak Farsi, and then... Uh, then Turkish after that, and Kurdish, and Baluchis, and Arab, Arabic, and uh, we have several languages in Iran. And if we go based on that, yes, we have different minorities in Iran, at the west, uh, in the south, east, south of Iran, north of Iran, they speak two different languages, Mazani and Gilaki, there are two different languages there. So, I mean, um, we need to connect with all of these people. And... Uh, I think uh, one of the other things that we brought in this uh, charter is that we, all of us respect the integrity of the country with respect of diversity. I think when we brought this uh, in the charter, we tried to assure everybody the way we think that this diversity is important and uh, everybody has a part in this revolution and hopefully in future of Iran. I agree. And I think that, you know, we always say that if I were to write a charter of Dr. Esmayun, Mr. Muhtadi, Dr. Abadi, all of us, any one of us were to write our own charter, it would look different to what we wrote. The idea is that we're agreeing to a basic minimal set of principles that we can all agree on, which is why it took some time. I mean, these things don't happen overnight. You have to set aside your differences and have conversations of what we can basically agree on. And I think that instills hope because we haven't had that process for 44 years um, of what is the, what are the basic things that we can all agree on, given our different ideologies. Um, so we, that, I think, should should give people hope that it, it's only going to build and that um, and also one thing that we recently spoke of is it's become abundantly clear that, you know, the saying goes, as the saying goes, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be cured with what's right with America or any democratic country, I would argue. But that's not true about Iran. The very pillars that hold up the Islamic Republic uh, are not that you can't change, you know, and they, they ensure that its wrongs cannot be made right. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that the if we want to form a democracy, we have to be reformable. We have to be what the Islamic Republic is not. And we have to be open to feedback. We have to be open to um, opening our arms to different people and ideas. 
and improving. And I think that is essentially what we're trying to demonstrate, that it is possible. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to come back uh, in a bit more detail to the issue of transitional justice that you mentioned uh, two questions ago. One uh, recommendation more specifically on, on this, uh, this issue of transitional justice that, that some activists have uh, mentioned is the issue of an amnesty for uh, members of the regime in the event of a transition. Um, whether it's soldiers and the security services, bureaucrats, especially at lower levels, um, is a transition possible without some form of amnesty for some members of the regime? Obviously not all of them, uh, but is this something you have thought about and, and how would you look on? There are different organizations, uh, especially out of Iran, that they're working on this issue. We have, for example, Roman Foundation that they have worked on this issue for years. Our association is uh, working on transitional justice. And I hope that all these groups can come together and think about future. What this is in my mind, it's something like Nuremberg trial. I, I might be wrong, but this is what I, the way I'm thinking. The, after World War II, I mean, all the uh, people responsible for the atrocities, uh, in, in Nazis, you know, they, they came to, to the court and they sat on the witness stand and they were tried. And now, even now, we see that they find somebody responsible for these kind of crimes and they, they bring them to justice. This is the way I look at it. I think if anybody who shot like a bullet is responsible for what he's doing. But we, we, we have to think about this, that we are talking about revenge. We are talking about justice. We are talking about discovering the truth. From all of this audience here, every, every Iranian in this, in this hall, if you ask them, they can remember a name that was killed innocently. And we, we don't remember, and we don't, I mean, we don't know anything about the truth. We don't know about the the uh, there were, I mean, the conspiracies in in 1980s. They killed thousands of people in 1980s. The the way they oppressed uh, the the uh, student movement. The the way they, they suppressed the the green movement. The, the what happened in in blood in November. In blood in November, we don't even know how many people were killed. Some people are talking about 1,500, and some people are talking about more than 5,000, 4,000. This is what happened in Iran. There are graves that have no names. And uh, I, I, was, I was in Iran when, when, when Green Movement happened. And I, I had a patient, I remember, and his cousin got shot a week ago and they buried him somewhere. And nobody knows his name, even now. He was a 16-year-old boy. What happened to that family? What about that victim? Who killed him? I think we need to find the truth for every single victim of Islamic Republic. But as I said, we are not talking about revenge. I'm talking about uh, discovering the truth and justice. I, I, I agree with that 100%. I would say when, when you're transitioning out of a, out of a dictatorship and, and trying to achieve democracy, two things are important, accountability and justice, of course but also changing people's hearts and minds. You're not going to change the system until you have defectors, people who join the people uh, from the, the leading class, the ruling class. Um, so in order to do that, you have to logistically, realistically, find ways to have uh, accountability alongside some kind of um, integration, reintegration of people who are low-level offenders. Um, to be able to redeem themselves and make amends and join the people. Otherwise, you're not going to have that break away from, um, you know, uh, from the, the current system, the regime. So you have to give some low-level offenders the hope that, of course, nobody who's shot a bullet, nobody who's actively killed anyone or, or ordered for people to be killed, those people face a trial, they stand trial, and they get prosecuted. Um, but I'm talking about people who don't have blood on their hands but have been part of the system. Um, you have to find ways to, to bring them to the side of the people, otherwise change won't happen. But I agree completely with what Dr. Esmailun said. 
that justice and transitional justice is, is key here and, and holding people to account and ensuring that the, these people are account, uh, you know, answer, answer to the Iranian people for their crimes. Thank you. The difference between justice and revenge is a, is a key one to make, that hard in practice, but certainly a, a central one. So a last question before we open it up uh, for uh, Q&A from, from our audience. And so I invite you to start thinking about uh, your the questions you would want to ask uh, our speakers. We are in Canada, so of course I need to ask a Canadian specific question. Uh, what more or what different would you like to see the Canadian government do in the coming weeks, months, um, with regards to the protests in Iran? I can talk to till tomorrow about this topic. <laughs> No. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So uh, from the beginning, like I'm talking about PS752, for example, we expected our government to take this case to the Security Council. They didn't do that because we wanted to take Islamic Republic and all the perpetrators of this crime to International Criminal Court. And the only way was to go to Security Council. They decided to not do that. The other thing was our government uh, or, or RCMP could have started or opened a, a criminal investigation about PS752. They never did that. They were protests, they were petitions and all of that. They never did that. The other two demands that we had was to take this case to the International Court of Justice. Hopefully this is happening in three months and one day from now. And uh, we expect to see this happening uh, in, in end of June or July. And one of the other most important things is IRGC, designating IRGC as a terrorist organization. I don't know how many times we have to insist and talk about this issue and just bring it forward, learn about the legal complexities and try to help. And then everybody is just uh, giving us answers that's not uh, acceptable in my opinion. In our parliament 2018, this resolution has been passed, that IRGC is a terrorist organization. Both main parties, the conservative parties and liberal parties, they voted yes to that, to that resolution. And NDP said no, but now these days, even NDP members are willing to, to vote yes. So I, I can tell you that the majority of parliament are, are uh, supporting this. The community of Iranian Canadians are supporting this. We know, we understand that there are some legal complexities, but I mean, they have had enough time to fix that. Five years. Even on, on October, when we had a discussion about putting IRGC on the list of the terrorist organizations and the government was under pressure of the opposition party, we expected to do it in a way that... Uh, uh, there's a criminal investigation for anybody related to IRGC and doing money laundering in this country. We expected to see that the oligarchs or people related to Islamic Republic, their officials, their relatives, their, their children get expelled from this country. And uh, we're still waiting. We're still waiting for months and uh, years. So to sum up, we had four main requests from our government, and just one and a half was met by by, by the government. Um, I yeah, I'm one hundred percent agree. I I don't understand why the IRGC hasn't been designated already. Um, and to add to that, I think I, I think you recently spoke of Professor Jano, um foreign interference. Um, and how that affects people inside, and particularly the people by those governments who are targeted, the Iranian diaspora is one of those uh, communities. We continue, Canada continues to uh, provide safe haven to uh, sordid characters, to kleptocrats, to um, basically pe people, members of the regime, um, who are very detrimental to the aims of the Canadian government and to the Iranian Canadian diaspora. Um, and that has to end. We cannot continue to harbor. We have we need a foreign agent registry. I think that you suggested is, is a is a great step forward. Um, but having allowing these people to live freely and comfortably in democratic countries is uh, just astounds me um, and is so counterintuitive. What we need to do is open the doors to 
um, political refugees who actually need to be here. And there are so many of them. Um, and of course, the brain drain is real in Iran, and you're seeing the best and the brightest either in jail or in exile. Um, and so the, the problems are, are numerous. We're trying to approach them one at a time. The designation, the safe haven, give, providing safe havens to um, regime agents and officials, cronies should end. Um, and of course, uh, internet access is, is, is another thing that we have to have um, and we have to focus on how do we solve this? How many more people need to die because they can't organize, because they can't communicate with the outside world? So these are key issues, and I think they're solvable if we all collectively put our minds to it. Thank you. Um, so we will now move on to the next stage of the uh, event, which is Q&A from uh, you in the audience. We put a mic uh, right there, so I invite you to uh, uh, go and put yourself in line at the mic. Um, please, if you can, uh, introduce yourself uh, before you ask your question. I would also ask you uh, respectfully to keep your question fairly short um, as you ask it uh, to our uh, two speakers. And um, yeah, why don't you go first? Sir? Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Humayun Fatimzadeh. I'm living here in Ottawa, and I welcome you all to our city in behalf of my friends who could not attend this meeting. Um, I would like to extend our support 100% behind you, as we have done in the past uh, demonstration in Ottawa. But I have few questions or concern. These are not supposed to be understood as a condemnation or kind of uh, explosion or something, but just take a note because in my opinion, these questions are going to be very essential for the being or not being, the, for the development of this alliance or not. I start with IRGC. You mentioned just a few minutes ago that one of our principal demand from the government of Canada, and not only government of Canada, probably other nations as well, other government, to forbid and condemn the IRGC and restrict them to be here to make any economic or business relationship and also expel their agents in Canada. So, that is very honorable uh, demand, which I stand 100%. But well, how come that now in these and next days in Stanford, there is a very crucial conference taking place, including Shasta, there is a Pahlavi, and probably yourself and a few other uh, members of this group, that they are saying directly or indirectly that when it comes to the revolution, we are going to keep IRGC. We are not, they never condemned IRGC in a sense that to announce or uh, mention that we want to destroy this organization, not killing everybody and flooding everywhere, no, destroying the organization from the, from the beginning to the end. All the structure of this organization is a terroristic organization. You cannot keep a terroristic organization in Iran, which were responsible for 44 years uh, killing and suppressing and torturing people. That is a clear contradiction between that what you and us, we are saying and demand from the government of Canada. On the other side, what thought is going on, and also it was mentioned by Shraza de Pahlavi, that uh, Sepai Pasaran and, uh, and the army of Iran, they are going to be in future, or also our friends they are going to be in future, also our, um, our uh, defending organization. That is one thing. Second. Oh, absolutely. I have a few, uh, few little, uh, little ones. So the other one is the, you in the, in your plan, which is called Manchuri. You mentioned a, a, a paragraph which uh, relates to keeping the sovereignty of Iran or the land the way it is, right? 
So I am myself behind that. I wish that Iran never get destroyed or separated in any way and shape. But are you not sitting in a chair in Canada where with respect to self-determination of folks? What about Ca Quebec? You, Professor Geno, you know better than all of us that here in Canada, we had many uh, votes that it was, came even so close, even to the 1% margin, so that Quebec was separated from Canada, I guess in the time of uh, Jean Chrétien. So how come that in Iran, in future Iran, if we really democratic-minded people are, uh, want to be, we want to forbid this right from Iranian people to separate if the folk, if the majority of that uh, folk, uh, for any reason, stupid or not stupid reason, want to separate. Okay. Thank you. I have others, but I I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly jump in so we get to the other questions. Um, nobody's forbidding. This charter is not. Uh, any kind of, um, it, it's it's the, the basic tenets of what we believe in. Belief is very different to dictating to people what should happen. The only thing that that, that will be devised in the future by is a referendum and a ballot box. Um, and experts will write a constitution for the country that will address all of those things. Um, so this is not meant to dictate to anyone what they should believe, what they should do. It's a set of principles, a set of ideas for, for what we think would help um, ease the transition to democracy. And from the voices we're hearing inside Iran, um, there is a very, very a huge sense of unity wherever in the country you're from. Everyone is saying we are Iranians, we stand together from Kurdistan to Baluchistan to Tehran to everywhere in the country, um, you are seeing a sense of unity. So that's what we're trying to reflect in the Charter. With regards to your statements about Prince Reza Pahlavi, I, I'm not aware of any of those statements. I don't, I don't even remember that he spoke at Stanford recently. Um, but uh, I can tell you that what ended up in our Charter was democratically um, signed off by everybody within the group and that we all came to uh, agreement on the language of the Charter. And about the first question you had, abolition of IRGC. I think all the six members of the alliance, they signed that. So it means that everybody believed in that. I don't know, uh, were you specifically talking about one person in Stanford or a group of people? I'm not, I, I didn't watch every, every, but I, haven't, I haven't participated in all the webinars and online meetings uh, there, but in my beliefs, in our beliefs, uh, in future Iran, we should not have an organization named IRGC. Thank you. Uh, we'll take the next question. If I can remind you to please keep your questions uh, brief, please. Sure, sure. So my name is Rosa Kirandish, and I am uh, a member of the All for Iran group, which is based in Ottawa. And uh, I am proud to be a part of a diverse team uh, of Iranian professionals who share a common goal, just like you, like your goal. And uh, it's just uh, it's just what you highlighted in Tirgan. And our, town, our team uh, aims to promote the women life freedom movement by engaging in political advocacy, raising awareness, and building strong relationships with Canadian politicians, just like Mr. Asasi here. And uh, what I would like to ask uh, from you today is that in your opinion, what strategies would be most effective in fostering collaboration among diverse groups with a shared common goal? And uh, how can we work together more efficiently by aligning our approaches and coordinating our efforts, perhaps through the development of a joint campaign and uh, other initiatives? That's my question. Thank you very much. First, uh, thank you for wearing uh, our association's um, logo. Thank you very much. And uh, I think establishing networks is the key. Uh, we have some plans. We are working on some um, projects to, to do that, especially in diaspora. But we need some time. As we said uh, two, three, two, three days ago in Tirgan event, uh, we, we are aware of the diversity of, of uh, our community. We are aware of all the technocrats, I mean, educated people that they want to help. 
but we just need to um, help to organize. That's the key. We need this organization, all, all these organizations out of Iran and inside Iran, because the revolution is going to happen in Iran. We should not forget that revolution happens in Iran, doesn't happen in Berlin, doesn't happen in Toronto, doesn't happen in LA or anywhere else. So to empower people of Iran and to enable all these groups out of the country, we should have some plans. And I just want to assure you that we are working on those plans. So there's nothing right now to... Give us a few weeks. Is it, is it fair? <laughs> okay, yeah, a few weeks okay. is fair, but... Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> I 100% agree. We're on it. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Soru Um uh, uh, My question is, what challenges have you uh, encountered in, in seeking support from other opposition groups and political actors? Have they raised ob objections to specific areas of the charter? Uh, and if so, which ones? Furthermore, have there been any requests to expand the charter to include additional points? And if so, what are they? So my, in, in, in short, my question is, what is the problem? Why are they not joining? I, I, I can tell you that we've received at least um, far more positive than negative feedback. But as I alluded to earlier, if we want to set ourselves apart from the Islamic Republic dictatorship, we have to be open to, open to reform, we have to be open to growing, improving ourselves, and being accountable for what people don't like. Um, and so we've been listening, we've been actively listening, we've had numerous Zooms, conversations individually as a group, uh, with experts, and uh, you know, we have to have, have room for growth. And I think that's the key right now. And I think the key thing in deciding that in how to improve is expanding plurality and diversity within the group um, so that everyone feels represented and everyone feels like their voices are being heard. Something I can add, this charter was a new experience in our community. Um, I don't remember anything like this in our history that like six people with different ideas, different political views, sit together and uh, agree on something. I mean, uh, working on a revolution. So something that uh, sometimes surprises me is that uh, supporters of uh, any of the signatories of the charter, like any of them, ask them to just talk about their own principles. Nobody removed the principles of any of these signatories. They can keep, you know, they keep their values. Their the the they can. Um, I mean, the point of views are out there. Nobody wanted to limit anybody or or say, okay, you should not talk about, for example, this or that. They have the right to speak out and talk about their own values. We just agreed on some common ground. This is important. Not me, not Ms. Bonyadi, not Mr. Pahlavi, and Mr. Mohtadi, Ms. Ali Najad, and uh, Ms. Abadi. We, we never forgot the way we are thinking, but we just agreed on some common principles. This is important. I think every supporter of any of these individuals should notice to this point. Uh, thank you. I totally understand and totally uh, agree. Uh, my, my question is specifically, can, is there anything that you can share with us that, uh, for example, this part, uh, particular group or party or person, they are, uh, they object a specific thing? Just check the Twitter. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hello. Hi, my name is Yasaman. I'm a fourth year political science student here at the Ottawa. I'm very happy to have you here in our fancy building. Uh, just a quick couple of questions. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to work with even larger and broader examples of minorities. And, you know, as part of people who are considered ethnic majorities in the country, we often end up seeing certain groups through a particular lens, to the point that we even forget certain groups exist. For example, Afro-Iranians or who we colloquially call as Koli, which would be the Rome and the Don people, or even our Afghan immigrants. When it comes to working with these minorities, a big issue is to be able to give them an opportunity to voice their concerns or give them a seat at the table, especially because they have been stricken of their power 
by this regime and the one previously from that. And when it comes to voting, once again, after the fall of this regime, there's not going to be proper representation because again, these people have been denied citizenship. And the language when it comes to giving these people an opportunity, it's almost somewhat vague. And it, it does happen because we are coming from a position of power. Is there any way that you had any particular plans or any further details and efforts in communicating with different diverse groups of people, or for example, implementing examples of EDI, like equity, diversity, and inclusion? And in case doesn't, if anyone doesn't know what equity is, it's like equality plus. So tailoring to the people's needs. What we would say barabari in Farsi would be equality, but equity would be half in this case. I'd like to hear from both of you what you decide on that matter. Just really quickly, I want to say that equity, equality, inclusion, diversity, all of those things are things that even in democratic countries we're struggling to achieve. So now imagine trying to, from the very bottom up, trying to establish a somewhat a demonstration of what democracy might look like. Here's just six people who disagree with each other, um, but who, are, who find common ground. So I think one, I want to manage expectations because I think we don't want to carry the weight of overnight, we're going to solve every problem that hasn't even been solved in any democratic country. That's just not going to happen. Um, but what we can do is give it every best effort to find the voices and include them um, so that that in, is an eventuality, is an inevitability in the future. Um, realistically, I can't imagine the six of us solving problems that are ongoing in, in, in the free world. Um, but with your help, and I, I, I stress this, this is not something that the six of us can solve. We can't. We need your input. We need your help. And I urge you to please take this as a plea from me personally. I'm not speaking from the group. Please help us. We need your help. We need you to be allies to the, the greater cause in Iran because nobody is sit sitting on a parapet saying we've got all the answers. We simply don't. We're just giving it our best shot. Uh, Mr. Oh, cool. yeah. I, just, I just want to emphasize on what uh, Ms. Monia just said. You know, I grew up in Iran. I, 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 I know the way the Islamic Republic treated Afghan uh, people coming to our country. They, they were considered, I don't know, uh, you know, when, when, when we were second class citizens, I can't imagine uh, where they, how they, they treated the Afghan families. And uh, I remember the the time that the Afghan kids they were not allowed to go to school. I remember uh, they they had they didn't have work permission for a long time. I I remember that uh, uh, even if, as you said, uh, identification cards and it, it was not issued for them. So we future Iran should fix these problems. And actually, you know, if you we have peace. And if we have equality in Afghanistan, why the people of Afghanistan should immigrate? I think we have to deal with this octopus with dealing with the head of it. And that's Islamic Republic of Iran. I think if the, the, this regime is gone, we can, have, we can see a stability in the region from Afghanistan to Syria, to Yemen, to Iraq, all of those countries will be affected. Uh, I think if Islamic Republic is overthrown, hopefully Taliban will be, will be, will be next. Thank you. Uh, so just to reiterate, so basically what you're saying, if this regime falls, most of the problems in the Middle East with the war crimes the government has committed would also help shift the paradigm in the Middle East and also change the perception the world has towards it as this war-torn, war-mongering region. Exactly. That okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Bonjour à tous. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Thomas. So, and welcome to University of Ottawa. I want to say to Mr. Sassi, who's not here, that you, he can come to our building is more fancier than here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, I, I want to share a worry, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I want to share a worry, which yesterday also I shared with a couple of uh, other people in another meeting. I'm originally Kurd. Ethnically Kurd from Satres, the city of Jinnah. You call it Nassau, which is a different story. So uh, 
Two of my uncles, they were killed by Islamic regime. My father was in prison for more than 12 years. I lost my hearing ability due to Islamic regime because they want to execute me at the front of a, for no reason. So we have a common, common pain, right? Some of us, we have more pain in, the, in our heart. So it's, it should be clear in that sense. Well, the day that Gina was killed, people of Sakas, they went to, to their house and they called the father and they say that, well, don't, don't deal with this regime. We'll support you. They were not any political parties. I say that clearly yesterday in the meeting that uh, Ms. Uh, Afshin Jam and uh, Dr. Moriji organized. So there were no political party party uh, just organizing this. They sent six ambulances. No one knows about that. And yesterday I requested have a permission to make it public. They six, sent six ambulances to bring the body to Sakas. Okay. After that, the political parties they supported the movement, and you have seen what happens in the, in, in the entire of the country. What I am really worried at this moment is that individuals they lost the trust. I'm, I'm, I'm honest with you, okay? It's not my opinion, but it's the feedback that I'm receiving from inside the Bureau. They lost the trust. Why? Because it started with a huge number of groups and leaders, you know, political parties and leaders. You are leaders. I will call you really leaders because I'm following you. And then it reduced to six people. And it reduced now to two people here. And yesterday, oh, a day before yesterday was five people. So even the two political party, Kurdish parties, they didn't sit in the same table. So we have really long way to go. Do you have any plan? I mean, I'm not talking about theoretical plan. I'm talking about the practical plan for the people of Iran, because we have to go inside. Is, as you say, is an octopus. We are not dealing with the standard government. What are the plans? Free internet? Well, tell us more. How can we help? If he's, he's helping people inside, I mean, making, you know, uh, mobilize hospitals, well, tell us how. And if you're working with more people, that we, we, we can be united. So that's really the worry that I have. It's, it's uh, just yesterday, a day before yesterday, Iranian regime, they got money, direct money from Iraq. You know about that. Why they use it? Of course, for killing people. So I, I would like to hear use your opinion as a leader, as leaders, and tell us what are your plans for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, for me, I, I have to give the same answer that I gave to one of the other questions that uh, not only the six people, I think every Iranian diaspora or inside Iran, we are responsible, every single person. And uh, if, if you're talking about the six of us here, and uh, I have to emphasize that please be patient for a few weeks, you know, we are working on some plans, but you know, this, or, you know, organizing, it doesn't happen in a night, it doesn't happen in a week. You hear that from someone who has worked in an organization for three years. We had a lot of difficulties in the first year to sit together, to listen together, to, to put everything in order and uh, to have different committees. It didn't happen in, over a night, you know. Uh, making an organization takes time. We just want to begin that. We have big, actually begun that with this alliance, but I mean, to empower people, it doesn't happen in night, in one night. We have to be patient and uh, we have to find ways to connect with everybody, to use uh, every person's um, expertise. And this takes time. I know that a lot of people in our diaspora, they have started that, like a Stanford University um, seminar. I think one of the goals that they had was to uh, establish this kind of networks. Um, give us some time. And give give yourself some time too, I mean, to to join this organization and and uh, help our people in Iran. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I think anything, any substantive change takes thought, care, nuance, time. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And I think anyone who promises to deliver something in one week isn't gonna deliver you something that is gonna be uh, sustainable. I also want to stress that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome, as you know. 
for 44 years, we have done the same thing over and over again. We've torn each other down. When anyone's gotten up to try to do something, we've torn them down. We've opposed each other. We've fallen into, we've taken the bait from the regime of uh, the cyber army and, and attacked each other. We've even, even believed some of the narratives that they put out. And all it's done is, is pitted us against each other. This exercise in unity, this sort of demonstration of what it might look like, what a democratic Iran might look like, is an important one. It's not something to be taken lightly. But I, I again, stress that six people are not going to do it. And if anyone says that the, that the weight of that should be on our shoulders, then this thing's going to fail. It takes all of you, all of your different factions, ideologies, organizations, the 44 years of various human rights organizations, various groups that are dealing with medical justice, environmental justice, um, technocrats, you name it. We need you. And I don't think any one of us are delusional enough to think that we have all the answers. So, so thank you for what you said. It's an important um, you know, encouragement for us to speed things up. But I can promise you, if you want this thing to work, it has to have thought behind it and it has to have real care behind it so that the outcome is lasting. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, both of you and Professor Zhuo. Uh, I'm very happy to see Dr. Esmail Leon. I'm Mehnu uh, Shepteda, I'm a dentist in Ottawa. And uh, Mrs. Bonyadi, I loved how you talk. Um, and it's wonderful to see somebody from uh, international policy studies uh, here in this pattern. Um, I want to ask that what the leaders really have done to tone down their followers. The reason that I'm asking is, uh, I feel that despite living in a democratic uh, country like Canada, uh, right now, right now, um, we still live in a, uh, in a tribal ideology and, and um, old baggages that, you know, as you say, each one of us as Iranian carries. When revolution took place, I was seven years old. So I saw before revolution, I saw the day first of the revolution. I'm a Zoroastrian. I'm, a, I'm like a um, first nations of my motherland. So the way that, you know, I have lots of Baha'is friends, when we talk about the minorities, where are they? Maybe even uh, we call about it, um, being uh, uh, united or ask people to voice. But um, how, for example, I don't know how can I um, communicate with you guys directly. Um, I feel that, you know, some people that they have, um, they are in charge, they are very disconnected of how really people inside things. Professor Giraud, if you are the professor of the Center of International Policy Studies, I personally suggest with no apology, stop using the words Persian and non-Persian. We are all Iranians. What we see inside Iran is a total uh, unity between everybody, Kurds, Turks, Baluchs. Nobody talks about even, and for Canada, this is a multicultural society, despite the fact that we, we come from different countries, but Iran is, we, none of us come from different countries, except Afghans that they are here. We are different ethnicities and we respect that. So, um, and sometimes, for example, I've, uh, I'm very curious to see that, what do you really teach your students in this faculty? Um, what, we, what I observe in, in graduates of, uh, of a, uh, policy uh, determinants uh, groups, and then when you say that what you expect uh, Canada does, what, what can I expect when I see that the leaders of democratic uh, countries go and shake hand with, with uh, a foreign minister that uh, he lies in the, in the plain air. So um, I want personally to see toning down and the leadership. We, we, none of us, you are, you are normal people. I don't think that, for example, before, um, I know that how much responsibility a dentist has in his office. I don't think that you know, Dr. Ismailun ever wanted to be a leader of, uh, of such a, 
um, such a um, group. But on the other hand, um, we, we saw the real uh, side of the life. It's very different when you read a book, when you live in that situation. So uh, I want to see a toning uh, down of the uh, followers, the unity. My, I talk to my friends back in Iran. I agree with that gentleman. They are, they are, losing, uh, they are losing trust. They, they don't, they, they are, they are um, coming to this point that they don't take this group seriously. And the, 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 fact, the fact is because uh, in, inside, uh, you know, uh, and they expect a lot. I I'm sorry, could I ask you to, we have a few sure, more questions sure. and only a few more I, minutes to go so to wrap I, up your I question. I specifically asked them that, you know, do you want, for example, somebody like me go and demonstrate? And they tell me that, yes, we expect you guys to be there. But on the other hand, when I myself here, I see the divide or, for example, e extreme um, behaviors, I become disappointed. What can we do about it? Thank you for your events and, and question. I think each one of us has a responsibility to strip ourselves of, of this extremist dictatorial mindset. I, I said it before, but my goodness, it's been instilled and ingrained in us by this regime. And this is this is each one of this is my plea to each one of you to in your networks, in your groups, when you see any kind of extremism, um, nip it in the bud. Don't don't align yourselves with people because I can tell you the six of us, when we sit in a room and we have conversations, it's civil. And I've never met a more democratic group of individuals, every single one of them. I don't know why some followers of, of every single one of us feels the need to attack others because I can assure you, none of us condone it. None of us. So we, how many times do we have to sit in front of a camera and say, Hey, don't if you're my follower and you believe in what I'm saying, if you support what I'm saying, if you believe I'm a good person, if you trust me, don't do that. I don't know how many times we have to say that. I, I don't think that we should say that. We should have to say that. Please look at the person's actions, their words, how they've lived their life, and only judge them based on that. What are they saying? What are they doing? And if people around them claim to be their supporters, any one of us, who act differently to those principles, they can't claim to be supporters. And I think that's, that's just basic, a basic logic, right? So please stay away from extremism. That is what's ruined us for 44 years. And I honestly think it's the key to our success. I'm not asking you to all support us. If you disagree, please voice your disagreement in a civil and productive, constructive manner. But anything else is so counterproductive and only plays into the Islamic Republic's hands. Oh, did you, Hi, uh, sorry, did you want to jump in? No. My name is Masa Mortazavi. I'm with the Iran International TV. Dr. Ismailun, I've heard you uh, for the past three years, more than three years, saying we never forget and we never forgive. Yet a very important part of transitional justice is to forgive. How do these two uh, point of views contradict each other? I've, I've heard... Um, the group of six people also say we never forget and we never forgive. Is this going to affect the transitional justice that the community is hoping for? When we talk, you know, I, I have to explain that again. When we're talking about we never forget, we never forgive, um, I think it's important to understand this is not about revenge. This is about, I say it again, this is about discovering the truth and about justice. When we're talking about forgiveness, just think about the people that we have to forgive. You know, there, there. I was, I was reading a, 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 like a piece of uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Jack Goldstone that he has done a lot of research about uh, every revolution, and one of the five elements that he mentioned is necessary for for revolution is to see some some of the like high officials of the uh, current government they think that they have a future in new government after the revolution and they can join the people and people can see that two or three or some figures 
in the regime, they come forward and join others. You just give me one name among the people that you, you, you remember in the last 44 years that they've been power, that they're not corrupted, but the blood of people are, are not in, on their hands. You just give me one name. You know, this is my problem. You know, I'm thinking, okay, who? Who you think that can join people in this regime? I mean, all the figures that I know from the reformists that they're still supporting the regime to, to the hardliners, I mean, this is like something that we have made. All of them, they're working for, for the same dictator. But I don't, I can't recall a name that people can support or people can trust. That's the problem. When we are talking about forgiveness, who should we forgive? Do we forgive Hossein Salami? Do we forgive uh, uh, Ali Shamkhani? Do we forgive Ali Khamenei? We should not. I'm sure that everybody agrees on that. Probably you're uh, talking about uh, low-ranking officials. But... Uh, I'm actually talking about corporate security and trying to make sure that we are um, capable of uh, putting into trial what's ha what has happened. I'm not saying that, like necessarily we should forget or we shouldn't forget it or forgive. It's just that the greatest people who have gone through this, like Nelson Mandela, they have mentioned that forgiveness and forgetting something is different from each other. And it's, it's, um, it's a step towards uh, human rights as we are going forward for. I, I know what you say, you know, and the, with the truth and reconciliation uh, in South Africa, there have been problems after that because, yes, people came forward, they told the truth, but there was no punishment after that. So imagine you, there's an there's a IRGC officer sitting in an air defense unit, seeing a commercial airplane passing full of children, and he knows that, and he pushes the button when he knows that. Who can forget forgive that person? When you have when you have a sniper in your hand and you see that an innocent boy or girl is passing in the street and shooting, can we forgive that person? I think they sh they are some people. There are some people in IRGC that probably they have the capability. They have the uh, I don't know expertise to be used, you know, or, or, or be hired by, by army, but about IRGC, there are 180,000 to 200,000 employees of IRGC. So number of Iranian population, I mean, Iran's population, it's not that much. They have branches. I know the Besiege and other organizations, they can be more than that. But I think they have to think about their responsibilities, they, what they're doing right now. You can't say after the revolution that it was an order. We have heard that a lot in every single revolution, that it was an order. We had to obey the order. No, nobody forced you to do that. You could have come and joined people. And they, they were some brave officers in, in um, army. I, I heard that they did it. So we have to see it from the whole I mean, the majority of them, but we don't see it. They, they stick together on this issue. And this is one of the problems. We have to find ways. I mean, I don't want to be prejudiced on this. I just want to tell you that the majority of the families that I know, they think that the operator of that air defense units can't be forgiven. That's for sure. He was responsible and Ali Khamenei was responsible too. But we have to work on transitional justice. We have to find a way to give a picture to people in Iran and all those people that are working for IRGC. This is future of Iran. And in my opinion, all of the high officials, they should be tried. And everybody who shot a bullet should be tried too. Thank you. Do you want to add something to that? I think, unfortunately, we actually are going to have to stop with my apologies to the several people in line, but it's already 3.30, and I do know that you have uh, other commitments. I really apologize to the many of you and to the others who may also have questions, but unfortunately, we will uh, have to stop. 
Before we finish, though, I would like to thank uh, a few people uh, very briefly. I would like to thank, first of all, Ali Sassi, who I think had to uh, walk out because this was our step out. Uh, this was his um, uh, at his initiative. I'd like to thank everybody in attendance uh, today uh, who came uh, to the event. In particular, and you'll forgive me for thanking in particular my students who are here. There's a few uh, who I see in attendance, including two who helped out uh, in front. I teach a fourth year undergrad seminar only on Iran, on history and politics. It's a full semester on Iran. We're in week 11 now. So by now we've covered a lot of ground and some of uh, the class is here. So thank you for uh, showing up. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the two of you, of course, uh, for uh, making this possible. Thank you. This was, I, I know how busy you are. So really thank you for coming and sharing your experience. And last but most important, I would like to thank Anna from uh, SIPS and her staff who uh, made this event possible at very short notice. Um, and of course, everybody else working with Anna uh, who helped out for the event today. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Et on va se revoir plus tard là, pour d'autres événements du CIPS à bientôt. Thank you very much.